record this. Welcome to your last lecture, official lecture for oral anatomy. We are going to be talking about functional occlusion and malocclusion, and then we're going to be reviewing the chapter that we've already gone over, which is clinical considerations, which is trying to put everything kind of into perspective again, because you've had to memorize a lot of things and draw a lot of things, but why are we really putting you through this dreaded, dreaded um, pace here? So let's go over occlusion. We've gone uh, talked about this in 141 as well. So this is going to be a review. If I can figure out how to advance my slide. Okay. Learning objectives. We're going to define the key terms. Okay. We're going to discuss what occlusion has to do with your uh, dental treatment as well as with the dental health for your patient, you are going to be doing a, an occlusal analysis on each and every one of your patients, each and every one of your patients. But, so let's dive in. The position and sequence of eruption, the eruption pattern, facial development, and sequence in which the tooth buds begin forming all contribute to the eventual relationship of the teeth and the jaws. So this is, um, you've got two parents, you've got a mother and a father or an X and a Y. And what usually happens with the offspring is you've got big teeth on a small jaw because you get a little bit of something from everybody. Big teeth on a small jaw, that's what my family got. So we were an orthodontic nightmare. Yes, we're going back to chapter six. This was in the beginning of the book, but I made it towards the end because it was just information that was too much for the beginning along with anomalies. So the development of occlusion begins with the eruption of the primary teeth. Now the tooth buds start forming how early of the primary teeth? Anybody remember? Very early on in utero, like four months. Does that sound familiar? Yep. Okay, so anyway, uh, <laughs> you've got these primary teeth developing before the baby is even born. So the mandibular central incisors are usually the first to erupt, as you know, because we've gone over the eruption pattern, followed by the maxillary central incisors, and then anything goes. If it was a perfect world, it would be the mandibular central incisors, the maxillary central incisors, then the mandibular laterals, and then the maxillary laterals. Doesn't always happen that way. After the anterior, the central incisors are in, it's just a, uh, it can be a hot mess. But the primary molar uh, establishes the vertical height of the primary occlusion, the vertical height. Do you know what that is? How far that maxilla is from the mandible. It tells us also where that TMJ, how it's going to fit into the socket. Intercuspation, the mesial distal and buccal lingual relationship determining how the upper teeth will touch, hit, and interlock with the lower teeth. So know that term, intercuspation. And if you split up the word, you'll be able to figure it out. How everything meets, mesial distal, buccal lingual, how they interlock. So we've got what we call ideal occlusion and variations within the ideal occlusion. Anything that's not ideal is considered malocclusion. So we've got our class one ideal occlusion, then we've got our malocclusion. And even within class one, which is ideal occlusion, you can have malocclusion, rotations, crowding, those type of things. Then you've got class two malocclusion and class three malocclusion, and you need to be able to identify all of them. 
So let's talk about the position and sequence still. The upper primary molars also help establish the antero-posterior, right, that mesial distal relationship of the remaining deciduous teeth. So we're talking about side to side, all right, from the nose to the TMJ. Because their presence prompts the canines and the second deciduous molars to erupt around them. Now remember those first deciduous molars, their one-year molars erupt before the deciduous canines, all right? And then the two-year molars, the second deciduous molars erupt behind the first molars. So think about that sequence. The primary dentition erupts in a more upright position than the secondary teeth replacements. The average overjet of primary teeth, the average overjet. Now, when you see deciduous um, teeth pedo patients, you're going to still be doing an occlusal analysis, right? So the average overjet is three millimeters and the average overbite is two and a half millimeters, just average. So the maxillary anterior should fit over the mandibular anterior and the maxillary anterior should go about halfway and cover up those mandibular anteriors. The growth of the mandible and maxilla results in horizontal and vertical growth of the dental arches to accommodate the space. The teeth remain the same size, but what we want to do is create growth in the jaw. So there's going to be spaces in between those deciduous teeth and between the baby teeth. The largest spaces are often found mesial to the maxillary primary canines and distal to the mandibular canines. So those largest spaces are around the canines. And then as growth continues, the diastemas or spaces, the diastemas or spaces also develop between the incisors. Now a true diastema is a space between the central incisors. Everything else is just an open contact, but the more common term for diastema is being used any space between teeth. So you want them in the canine area, and you also want to see them in the incisors before those permanent teeth start coming in because they look like huge horse teeth compared to those little baby things. So the spaces are called primate spaces. You want to see these spaces, okay? They're called primate spaces because they're characteristic in all primates, including human beings. Again, these spaces allow for larger teeth to come in. The permanent molars erupt and touch the distal surfaces of the deciduous molars. Does that make sense? They come behind all the baby teeth. Your six-year molars come behind all those deciduous teeth. They cause a chain reaction that pushes all the spaces of the teeth closer together. And the mesial step occurs because the closing of the primary space allows room for the lower molars to move mesially. So when you're looking at occlusion for deciduous teeth, it's called a step instead of class one, class two, class three. We do not have you evaluate deciduous occlusion. So you're off the hook with that. If you're working in an ortho, if you're in a family practice and trying to prepare uh, parents and the child for future ortho issues, this is when their baby teeth are coming in, that's when you start talking to them. So a mesial step is further enhanced as the deciduous molars exfoliate while they're shed and are replaced by the narrower permanent premolars. So you've got these bigger deciduous molars. The premolars, permanent premolars, are a little bit narrower and that extra space is called a leeway space. So you've got your primate spacing, which is 
with the baby, all the baby teeth and your leeway space is gained when you're in that mixed dentition. The earlier eruption of the mandibular teeth before the maxillary teeth further helps to establish the mesial step. So again, our occlusion is going to be based on permanent first molars and permanent canines, but deciduous occlusion is going to be in the steps. And that's all you need to know about primary occlusion. A deep bite could result if, okay, the condyle head is displaced distally in the glenoid fossa, a deep bite, okay, the posterior teeth don't erupt enough. We're talking about that vertical dimension, right? And that is one of the main functions when you're looking at the functions of all the teeth, it helps establish vertical dimension. It was listed in almost for all the teeth. The muscles of mastication are so hyperactive that they prevent the eruption of the posterior teeth. So if they've got a really deep, deep bite and they're clenching all the time, those teeth aren't going to be allowed to erupt fully. The condyle grows at an angle that causes the jaw to develop in a less mesial direction. So that deep bite can actually inhibit the jaw formation. The development of occlusion is further influenced by hereditary factors, such as your congenitally missing teeth, impacted teeth, as well as the size and shape of the muscle and bone. Now, which are the most congenitally common missing teeth? And which are the second most? Do you remember? Third molars. Maxillary third molars is the first in the lateral incisors. Yes, maxillary third molars are the first most common and then the, um, and then the maxillary lateral incisors. Then you've got controllable factors that also affect occlusal, occlusal development that include premature loss of deciduous teeth, decayed teeth that weren't restored, as well as harmful habits. Now the harmful habits is not Bruxism, because some of these children grind, 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 and they just grind their baby teeth down to nubs. That is not necessarily one of those harmful habits that need to be corrected. What that does is it, it inhibits the vertical dimension, but things tend to even out once they um, get those permanent teeth coming in. So we want to have um, horizontal alignment, and that's the balance or equilibrium between the tongue and the facial muscles that allow the teeth to be brought into proper alignment, as well as to be maintained in their proper positions once they have erupted. So if the balance is disrupted, malocclusion or an abnormal alignment of the teeth within that dental arch can result. For example, uh, thumb sucking you're going to have an open bite. The thumb will create those anterior teeth to flare. Tongue thrusting does the same thing if you've got an abnormal swallow and the tongue is pushing on the lingual of those anterior teeth, the same thing is going to happen as if you were a tongue, uh, a tongue blah, 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 thumb sucker. Boy, that was hard to say. So this is an open bite. All right, abnormal forward thrusting of the tongue against the anterior teeth can cause that imbalance. That tongue is a huge, huge muscle. Tongue thrusting causes the maxillary anterior teeth to protrude. So every time this person swallows, instead of the tongue being uh, placed at the roof of the mouth, it's being placed behind those maxillary anterior teeth. And you can see that there's no overlapping here. This is called an open bite. So let's get into uh, the different profiles. You do need to know this for 141, for 111, and for passing your boards. They always ask stuff like this. All right, so we've got our orthognathic, retronathic and prognathic. 
facial profiles. The orthognathic profile is your neutral position. The retro, now we're, when we're talking about positionings, we are looking at the mandible, okay? So the retronathic, the mandible is retruded and the maxilla is protruded. So that's your overbite versus your prognathic, the mandible is pronounced. Orthonathic, retronathic, prognathic. So, orthonathic profile is your class one or neutro occlusion, class one occlusion. Okay, 72% of the people are supposed to fall here. And what you need to do in order to understand occlusion, you need to be able to pick it out in a picture like with A, and you need to be able to understand it if it's written. All right, so let's take a look. These lines, look at this is the mesiobuccal cusp, fits into the buccal groove for your molar. For your canine, you've got the cusp or the incisal edge fits between the canine and your first premolar. So this is the mesiobuccal cusp, fits into the groove. Normal, remember you've got your teeth divided up into thirds. For your overbite, your overbite is here and your overjet is here. You've got your neutral orthonathic profile. Normal overjet. Do you remember what it was on deciduous teeth? You didn't have to remember it, but it was three millimeters. So the normal for deciduous teeth is three millimeters, but you want to, you're gonna be getting three to five millimeters when you measure it this way. That's your over jet. When the teeth normally occlude in central occlusion, we're gonna get into that, the maxillary arch horizontally overlaps the mandibular arch, okay? So over jet, the maxillary teeth overlap the mandibular teeth. And again, third, third, and a normal over jet is when it's in the incisal third, when the maxillary incisors overlap the mandibular incisors. An opposite situation can occur if the lower lip is constantly tightening against the lower anterior teeth, and then you've got those lower anterior teeth pushed back by an overdeveloped lower lip. These patients are in pain that pain to try and scale because that lower lip is just going to fight you. And that's where you get your cotton roll out and try and um, give you a little bit of space. The intercuspation, remember how the teeth interlock of the teeth helps prevent tooth deviations in the buccal and lingual direction. They're interlocking. And when the jaws are closed, the buccal cusps of the mandibular posterior teeth are interlocked between the buccal and lingual cusps of the maxillary teeth. You know this, it's just putting it in writing. So you wanna close your eyes. When the jaws are closed, the buccal cusps of the mandibular posterior teeth 
are interlocked between the buccal and lingual cusps of the maxillary teeth because the maxillary teeth are more on the outside. The alignment of previously erupted teeth affects the alignment of successive teeth. It kind of has a snowball effect. Adequate space is needed between teeth to allow for complete eruption of more teeth. That makes sense. And if a tooth does not have room, it will erupt out of alignment. It still wants to erupt. That's the natural force. It's going to find the path of least resistance, right? If there's not enough space at all, it could be blocked entirely and never erupt, and that's an impacted tooth. Other factors that influence the alignment of teeth, mesial drift, Teeth want to move forward, especially if it's missing, if there's an open space, the size and shape of the jaw and the shape of the teeth. So again, you've got, um, you've got a 50-50 chance between two parents of uh, large teeth, small jaw, large jaw, small teeth, or perfection. So over jet, how you measure it, you take your probe, all right, and it's measured in millimeters. Once the patient is in centric occlusion, they bite down like they normally bite, and the probe is placed at a right angle to the labial surface of the mandibular incisal area and uh, to the base of the incisal edge of the maxillary incisor. So all you're doing is you're placing the probe here and taking your millimeter reading. Now, orthodontists will say you're supposed to be measuring a different portion of the tooth, but we're not in ortho. So that's how we're going to be measuring it. Over jet, horizontal overlap. Horizontal overlap. So this would be the probe right here. versus overbite. And overbite is the vertical overlap. Remember, overjet is the horizontal, overbite is the vertical overlap. And that's normally two to five millimeters. Remember the uh, deciduous was about three, two to five millimeters between the anterior segment of the two arches and it allows contact between the posterior teeth during mastication. So the patient's biting down, all right? So the teeth are touching. And then you're taking your guess. Excessive amounts of either overjet or overbite are classified as malocclusions. So you are taking a canine and a first molar. You're going to have your occlusion, one, two, or three. And then you're going to be determining overjet and overbite. So overbite is measured in millimeters with the tip of the periodontal probe after the patient is placed in centric occlusion. So they're biting down and you're supposed to be taking the probe and sticking it between the two teeth, maxillary and mandibular, okay, and taking a millimeter reading. Now, we're not doing that in clinic. What we're doing is we're dividing the tooth up into thirds, and we're going to have a slight, a moderate, or a deep or severe overbite. Slight, moderate, deep. So occlusion describes the relationship of the mandibular and maxillary teeth when the teeth are closed together or during excursive movements when the teeth are touching. What's an excursive movement? Can somebody give me a, an example of that? Is it bruxism? I'm sorry, Jonathan, you started. What? Bruxism. Bruxism could be excursive when the teeth are shifting. We put the patient in excursive movement as well when we try and do the canine protected occlusion, which we'll be getting into. So we're not only having the patient bite down, 
and checking the occlusion, the overbite and overjet, but we're taking them canine to canine on one side and canine to canine on the other. That is excursive movement, having that jaw, the mandible, move side to side or even forward. So when the jaws are closed, you have two possible relationships. You've got centric occlusion and centric relation. You need to know the difference between the two. Centric relation is the relationship of the upper jaw to the lower jaw versus centric occlusion is the upper teeth to the lower teeth. So relation is the jaw and centric occlusion are the teeth. Centric relation versus centric occlusion. How do the jaws meet and how do the teeth meet? So centric relation is defined as the most retruded position of the mandible to the maxilla when the condyles of the temporal mandibular joint are in the most upward and backward and unrestrained position in the glenoid fossa. Centric relation, if you've ever worked for a dentist and that's trying to um, establish occlusion, the dentist has their thumb and their forefinger on the patient's jaw and they're wiggling and wiggling and pushing and the patient's going, what are you doing? They're trying to get this centric relation, the most retruded relationship of the jaws. Okay, again, Centric relation is the jaws. Centric occlusion is determined with how the teeth fit together. Sometimes it's called acquired centric occlusion, habitual occlusion, convenience occlusion, or intercuspal positioning, ICP. Different textbooks list it as different things. So be familiar with centric occlusion habitual occlusion, convenience occlusion, intercuspal position. How do the teeth fit together? When the jaws are closed, the occlusal surfaces of the maxillary teeth touch the occlusal surfaces of the mandibular teeth and they fit together. The lingual cusps of the upper posterior teeth rest in the occlusal surfaces of the lower posterior teeth. So the lingual cusps of the upper, okay, fit in, this is the lingual cusp here, they rest in the occlusal surface of the posterior teeth. So this buccal cusp here on the maxillary, right, the buccal cusp of the lower posterior teeth rest in the occlusal surfaces of the maxillary. So the buccal cusps rest in the maxillary. Okay, so the maxillary teeth are overlapped buccally to the mandibular teeth. And if it's not, what's it called? That's called a crossbite. So when the jaws are closed in centric occlusion, so you're looking at the teeth, the cusp of the maxillary teeth overlap the cusps of the mandibular teeth. The amount of horizontal overlap of the maxillary teeth is called overjet. The amount of overlap is called overjet, which we've gone over. You're going to take your periodontal probe and you're going to measure overjet, two millimeters four millimeters, five or six millimeters, none, moderate, excessive. So when we're talking about a class one occlusion, remember when we were talking about wear facets, the mandibular will um, have occlusal or incisal wear on the facial. 
this won't have as much wear, this won't have any wear, and that patient's probably still having mammalons at the age of 40 on the mandibular anterior. So you're taking a measurement versus the over, uh, overlapping is overbite for the vertical. So you've got your vertical for overbite. And again, you've got your slight, moderate, severe, or deep, and you're dividing that tooth up into thirds. And where is that overlap? Is it in the incisive third, which is slight, the middle third, or the cervical third for slight, moderate, severe, or deep? So you're just taking a guesstimate. The patient's biting down in centric occlusion, okay? They're biting down, and you're looking at the amount of overlapping, dividing the teeth up into thirds. So A is normal or slight, okay? That would be slight. B is moderate. C is deep or severe. And with me, after four years of ortho, you got, my overlapping is so much with my overbite, you can't see any of my mandibular anterior. They're completely covered. So if one or more teeth in the mandibular arch are located facial to their maxillary counterparts, it's called a crossbite. If teeth aren't mixing together, it's called a crossbite. This here should be there. So you're looking for crossbites and you'd be noting that. So how would you note that on your occlusal analysis? You would say number three and number 30 are in crossbite. If it's just two teeth. A crossbite can exist between any number of teeth. Acromegaly is a condition where the crossbite of all the mandibular teeth occurs. So that mandible is overgrown and the maxilla is undergrown. The disease in this disease, growth hormones causes the mandible to grow faster than the maxilla. Crossbite can also occur if the maxillary bones don't grow in proportion to the mandible. And when this happens, the maxillary teeth are usually edge to edge. Okay, it's not a true crossbite, but they could be edge to edge. If the anterior teeth are widely separated in centric occlusion, the condition is known as an open bite. Remember that tongue thruster. The anterior teeth of the maxillary arch do not overlap the mandibular anterior teeth in a vertical direction, an open bite. An open bite can be caused by thumb sucking or tongue thrusting or another habit because our tongue and our lips are very powerful sources. So ideally, the buccal cusp of the maxillary teeth are positioned more buccal than the buccal cusp of the mandibular teeth. So look at this, there is no intercuspation going on here at all. So you've got a true crossbite here, and this is going to be end to end. So there's degrees of crossbites. Now look at this. Ideally, the maxillary teeth are positioned more distal than their corresponding mandibular teeth. Does that make sense to you? The maxillary teeth, this is the lateral here. So let's look at the canine. The maxillary canine is positioned more distal than the mandibular corresponding tooth. Number seven is more distal 
than number 26. Number four, second premolar is positioned more distal than the mandibular counterpart. The other way of saying that is the maxillary teeth are positioned more mesial. No, the mandibular teeth, excuse me, are positioned more mesial. I'm getting myself confused. All right, so let's go over the curves. Curve of Wilson, curve of speed. The buccal cusps, okay, the buccal cusp tips of the posterior teeth have a fairly even curve in the anterior to posterior direction. It's known as the curve of speed. That curve of speed deepens with age, the curve of speed. You're looking ear, okay, from the nose to the ear, anterior to posterior, curve of speed versus when you're looking behind and the, there's an occlusal curve that exists for posterior teeth, this is the curve of Wilson for the posterior, looking behind curve of Wilson from right to left versus curve of speed is from front to back. Curve of speed from front to back, it deepens with age. And then there's a three-dimensional alignment that demonstrates an illusion of the cusp tips of the mandibular posterior teeth resting on a sphere called the sphere of Monson. I have not seen any board questions on the sphere of Monson, so I don't, um, I don't ask questions on it. Curve of Spee, I have seen. Curve of Wilson, I have seen. But Sphere of Monson is this, okay? The vertical alignment. They're not straight up and down. When we're talking about the long axis of a tooth and the Gracie curettes, for example, should be parallel to the long axis of the tooth. It's not straight up and down. Right? You need to envision all of these angles. That is a lot of manipulation for your instruments. So from the lateral view, all teeth will show a slight mesial inclination with the possible exception of the maxillary third molars. Anterior teeth have a slight labial protrusion. This is the important one here. A slight labial protrusion. What does that mean? That the anterior teeth are going to be coming over the mandibular teeth, right? But there is a slight labial protrusion. They're not straight up and down. Labial protrusion, labial protrusion. Occlusion describes the relationship of the mandibular and maxillary teeth when the teeth are closed together or during excursive movements when the teeth are touching. You've got your centric relation for the jaws and your centric occlusion for the teeth. Centric relation is the most retruded. And I have seen questions on this, so that's why I'm, I'm emphasizing it. Relation retruded, that's how I remembered it, the R's, okay? Relation retruded, it's like, Milli amperage, you know, milli is a number and uh, kill a voltage peak. You know, I, I, I have to play those games with me. All right. So um, centric relation is defined as the most retruded relationship of the mandible to the maxilla versus centric occlusion is determined by the way the teeth fit together. They should fit like a glove.
When the jaws are closed in centric occlusion, the cusps of the maxillary teeth overlap the cusps of the mandibular teeth. So I'm re, uh, going over this information again because I want this to be more of a visual in your head. The amount of horizontal overlap of the maxilla is called the overjet. and you're measuring with the periodontal probe. So you're going to be doing over jet in millimeters. You'll be marking that down on your occlusal analysis in millimeters. Versus over bite, you're going to be doing slight, moderate, and deep or severe. Because the vertical overlap is overbite. So know the difference between horizontal and vertical. Cross bites. Okay. So within each dental arch, the teeth also create contact areas as they contact the same arch neighbors on the proximal surfaces. Our teeth want to contact other teeth. They want them in the horizontal, they want an opposing tooth, and they want to have a neighbor as well, side by side. So this contact between neighboring teeth serves two purposes. It protects that interdental papilla and it stabilizes each tooth in the dental arch. So this is an edge to edge bite here. And this is a cross bite here because the maxillary is completely behind the mandibular. So you'd have a lot to write on with this one, but look at this. This is the maxillary canine, which fits between the canine and the first premolar. So that's a class one canine occlusion, but look at the malocclusion that's going on here. This is where you just want to throw your probe and say, I give up, All right? But again, what you would do is you would have the patient open, you would draw an imaginary line, all right, through their central fosses. And then is the tooth facial to that or lingual to that? So 24 and 25 are probably the ones that are in occlusion. 27 would be facially verted, 26 lingual verted. And then if there's any rotations, you'd be listing that as well. So this 22 looks like it could be facially torso verted. Torso version, we're always looking at the mesial. So this would be a mesial facial torso version. It could also be a distal lingual torso version, but that just confuses things. So we're always looking at the mesial. Tooth number eight is rotated in torso version. They say torsi, I say torso. And then look at the crossbite here, complete crossbite. This is an example of uh, different wear facets, but number one is super erupted or extruded in supraversion. And um, every time this patient bites down, this tooth is going to knock, okay? And it's gonna slide on this one. Posterior crossbite. Is this curve of Wilson or curve of Spee? Wilson. Curve of Wilson, yes. Curve of Wilson is from the posterior, but you can see that it is in crossbite.
And then you've got almost crossbite here. So you've got, um, you've got edge to edge, end to end. Edge to edge is the anterior because you've got incisal edges. End to end would be posterior. And you've got cross bites, or you can have a tendency towards a cross bite. It's not a real cross bite, but it's a tendency. Okay, that's an almost cross bite. We call it a tendency. They're not a class one per se, but it's a tendency towards a class one. It's not a class two, it's not a class three occlusion. It's kind of in between, tendency towards. Is this prognathic? Retronathic, those were your two? The prognathic. Prognathic. Prognathic, yes, okay, very good. And you've got an anterior crossbite here. So with this, you would take your measurement and call that an underbite, and you take your measurements there, just like you would a regular anterior. Deep overbite. This is this is Betsy here. This is me. You see none of my mandibular anteriors. They could not open my bite for the life of me. And uh, I had four different headgears. I was really a glamorous child going through high school. But anyway, think about where those mandibular anteriors are going to hit. They're going to actually hit the palate. And if there's any pizza or irritation, pizza burn or irritation, um, I can't close my teeth together. Just can't. Edge to edge. This is edge to edge right here. Edge to edge. They're not overlapping. Edge to edge and open. So you've got a lot to describe when you're trying to have a good occlusal survey. Now for the angles classification, we've got our maxillary canine fitting between the mandibular canine and first premolar. That's a class one neutral occlusion, but they have anterior malocclusion. Same way with here. This is fitting here. The mesiobuccal cusp is fitting in the buccal groove. Mesiobuccal cusp fitting in the buccal groove. So they could have class one occlusion, anterior open bite. that over jet or over bite? Over jet. Yeah, why did you say that with a question mark? It says right there on the slide. <laughs> over jet. So you're taking your, your probe and you're measuring that. This is what we call buck teeth, all right? Um, so, but for class one occlusion, you have that mesial buccal cusp is supposed to be fitting in that buccal groove and it's anterior to that. All right, so everything's pushed forward or it's retronathic. So this is class two occlusion. Now this is what you've got to memorize. All right, you have to be able to see this as well as know what it looks like. I'm not gonna be asking you to write it down, but you need to be able to identify what class one, class two, division one and division two is, and class three. Class one occlusion, the mesiobuccal cusp of the maxillary first, the mesiobuccal cusp, okay, of the maxillary first molar, fits in the mesiobuccal groove of the mandibular. For the canines, the distal half of the canine and the mesial half of the first premolar 
are in contact and look at where that incisal point is. It's right in between the canine and premolar. So you can have a class one molar and a class two premolar or something. It can, it can be different. Now, what type of overbite do you think this is? Is this slight, moderate, or deep? Slight. Slight, yeah. Class two malocclusion. Class two malocclusion always has to have something else with it. It's never just class two. It's a class two division one, or it's a class two division two. You have to have, if you are doing anything with a class two, you have to have that division one or division two along with it. So that's your buck teeth, where the anterior teeth come out forward or your retronathic, right? It's your retronathic division one is when the teeth flare out towards the buckle or towards the labial. Division two is when they're tilted in. Division one and division two. What do those anterior incisors look like? This is a class two malocclusion with an anterior overjet. So, where these two lines are supposed to be meeting up, right? Retronathic, class two molar with a division one. I love this, look at that. Schmutz in between two teeth. Class two, division one is the permanent dentition. The maxillary anteriors protrude facially from the mandibular anteriors. They usually have a deep bite. Usually have a deep bite. I was a big thumb sucker. I had a huge deep bite, an open bite. That turned into a deep bite. Division one, you've got the flaring of the anterior, maxillary anterior labially. Versus division two. In a permanent dentition, the molars are in the same position, but the maxillary central incisors are either upright or retruded. So these are usually pushed back a little bit or the laterals are forward a little bit. Division one, you've got your buck teeth. Division two, number eight and nine are retruded. Again, you've got a deep overbite. Deep overbite. Look at the laterals, they're coming out just a little bit. Then you've got your class three malocclusion, your prognathic, okay, where the mandible is forward. So look at the difference in the space between this mesiobuccal cusp that's supposed to be fitting in this mesiobuccal groove, it's way off. So you want to look at the mesiobuccal cusp and that mesiobuccal groove. You want to look at the canine and where does it fit to determine class one, class two, class three. If you are a class two, can you be a class two all by itself? No. No, you have to have a division one or a division two. But it can be a class three with, okay, it's going to be not only a class three, but this could be edge to edge, like the picture of the study models here, 
or it could be a full crossbite. Okay, so you will be asked to identify these for your lab practicum, as well as in the written form on the test. Is this the curve of Spee or the curve of Wilson? Curve of Spee. Spee. Curve of Spee, yes, you got it. Centric relation, again, relation is, okay, the most retruded. How many times can I say this? Is it important? You got to know the difference. All right, versus vertical, okay, occlusion is the vertical dimension as well. You want to check to see if it is a closed bite, an open bite. How do they fit together? And this is more of Mrs. Heberly's class for central centric jaw relation, the most retruded and how the jaw is supposed to fit. I don't get into that. Centric occlusion, I guess, is also that habitual occlusion. How do your teeth want to meet? What does your jaw, what do all the muscles do to get you to bite together? Centric occlusion centric relation. So centric occlusion is important because that's our habitual occlusion. That is how our mouth wants to, to meet and to be used, but the teeth become inclined and can become malaligned and super erupted with, uh, with no opposing tooth if just one tooth is lost. So the loss of a one tooth can really disturb the relationship of both arches and it can happen fairly rapidly. Mesial drift, super eruption depending on how the teeth are coming together. Don't freak out, you do, don't need to know this. You don't need to know this, but there's a lot, a lot that goes into having um, good bite, good vertical dimension. So this is where, if you work in dentistry, this is where the articulators come in that mimics the patient's bite so that when things are being fabricated in a lab, they can, uh, the lab people can uh, mimic what the bite is so things can meet together. We want to keep that vertical dimension. Okay, how do the maxillary and mandibular arches meet? It keeps our TMJ in a relaxed position. Our teeth should only be touching when we're swallowing or when we're chewing. When we are at rest, our teeth should not be biting down and touching each other. So gum chewers oftentimes will have a temporomandibular joint issues. You want the patient when you're looking at vertical dimension for physiologic rest, this is why the dentist wants the patient to be seated up, seated up, excuse me. Excursive movements, you're bringing that mandible edge to edge to the maxillary teeth to see how they fit together. Is the patient biting? Is the patient um, being able to bite properly? Is the patient bruxing? Are there wear facets and how do the teeth meet? And when you bring the jaw forward edge to edge for the anterior teeth, you also bring them side to side for the canines. So you can see a little bit of wear facet here, right? But that jaw is coming forward. 
What we do is we stop them edge to edge because we want to see how the teeth fit together. When you're getting into more TMJ, if you're in a TMJ practice, there's a whole lot of stuff going on. This is a class three tendency. You've got a tendency of a crossbite here. You've got a crossbite here. You don't have a full crossbite, but you've got edge to edge here. Would you be able to describe that? Then we've got our lateral mandibular relationship and occlusion. That's when you're taking that jaw side to side. You're getting canine incisal edge to canine incisal edge. When you do that, the only teeth that should be touching are these two canines. There should be space and there should be space if the teeth are in good canine relationships. So we're asking the patient to move that, um, that mandible, okay? Bring it forward edge to edge, bring it side to side, canine to canine. So as that jaw moves, because that TMJ is a hinge type of um, joint, you're going to be looking at those movements. And we are looking at it more for the wear facets. All right. All we're doing is making sure that the teeth aren't touching. Cusp to cusp, incisal edge to incisal edge. And I'm going to take the marker off, but you can see right here, Okay, those are where the teeth are touching and I'm taking the markers off now. So do you grind your teeth? I don't think I do. Well, then when you take them in the excursive movement, the patient will have a mirror and you can show them exactly how these teeth fit together. We don't know if they're grinding now or if they were grinding as a teenager or how long ago it was happening, but at some point those teeth were meeting like that, causing wear facets. Incising with the incisors, masticating, which is chewing and swallowing. Balancing side versus working side. You do need to know this. Balancing side when you're taking your jaw and moving it from one side to the other. You have a balancing side and a working side. The side to which the mandible has been moved is the working side. So that's what you need to know. The side in which the mandible has been moved is the working side. The other side is the balancing side. So we're doing canine to canine and it's called the canine rise or cuspid rise edge to edge on the canines. And for uh, we can also check for balancing interference. Now we really don't do this in uh, normal practice unless there is a TMJ component to what we're um, trying to investigate. The dentist usually does this, but no teeth should make contact on the contralateral balancing side. Now remember the balancing side is the other side where the jaw has moved from. If they contact, okay, if you can't pull the floss through, that's balancing interference. So there's bite issues. Parafunctional habits, you're going to be talking to your patient about, okay, do they have any? Are they clenching? Are they grinding? Are they biting their nails? What is a parafunctional habit? It's anything outside of the normal range of function. We want to know this because it can be putting stress on the temporomandibular joint. It can be creating wear facets, which is also going to create interference in that vertical dimension. And look at the other possible symptoms related to parafunctional contacts. Ringing in the ears, tinnitus, sinus pain, dizziness, head, neck, or back issues, TMJ pain from arthritis or injury, tired muscles of mastication, a sore tooth or sensitive to percussion. 
tooth mobility, rheumatist, tooth wear, widened PDLs, which is why it's so important to get some good vertical bite wings, angular bone loss, thickened lamina dura, root resorption, all from parafunctional contacts. What are treatments related to malocclusion? To teach avoidance. Stop clenching your teeth. Sometimes that's all it's needed. It usually isn't. Patient education, though, is key. There could be biofeedback. Um, there could be myofunctional therapy, jaw muscle exercises, nutritional counseling. Stay away from the bagels where you have to open your mouth real wide and you have to really chew and overuse those muscles. Sometimes Valium and other tranquilizers and muscle relaxers are necessary to get the patient out of acute conditions. Um, psychological counseling, let's reduce the stress. And occlusal bite guards or adjustments. So night guards, occlusal adjustments, orofacial myology. Orofacial myology is what myofunctional therapy used to be called, but it's retraining the muscles. It focuses on establishment of correct functional activities of the lips, the tongue, and the mandible. Myofunctional considerations. Trying to retrain. This is an occlusal device. They have a number of them out. Occlusal devices, oftentimes it will get the jaw in a more relaxed position. So it oftentimes will help with the maxillary and mandibular teeth coming together. It oftentimes doesn't stop the grinding, but what it stops is the wearing of the teeth because the patient is grinding on the occlusal guard, on the night guard, they're not grinding on their teeth. Sometimes the mouth needs to go through complete rehabilitation to give you back that vertical dimension if everything's been ground down. It's quite extensive. Again, trying to get you back in that vertical dimension. Realigning the jaws might take surgery. Is it ideal? No, but this is the same patient. Luxation versus subluxation, dislocated or subluxed, okay? This is one of those things that you're asking the patient to. In the dental history, you want to see if their jaw locks when they open. Sometimes it does, all right? There is a treatment for that. If they open and their jaw locks, you press on the buckle shelves down and back, okay? Because you're trying to snap that condyle back into the articular eminence. You do not do that. The dentist will do that. They will knock your fingers off, your thumbs off if you try and do it and you don't get out of the way. I had a new patient in the chair. I was just asking her to open. I was just doing a quick, quick review with my mouth mirror. That's all I did before I took the FMX on her and her mouth locked open. It had never locked open before. She panics. I, I don't panic. But um, anyway, uh, you never panic. Uh, I could not get her to relax enough. So I went and got my employer who could not do that down and back. So I had to escort her to the oral surgeons where they had more than one male dentist or strong dentist. And it took two of them to get that jaw to snap back into place. God love her. She came back and she even saw me too. Um, but all I did was ask her to open so I could take a look. If your office is into temporomandibular joint, there are a lot of tests and things that the dentist does. You will always, even on the um, Lab practicum and on your board will have a question on how old am I? It's usually a pan and it's usually mixed dentition. So how old do you think this person is?
Could they be like eight? Eight, yeah, eight. Okay, I'm going to say no, and here's why. All right, just, their sixes are in, right? And their root surfaces haven't completely formed yet. Okay, so that's one. So we know that there's six. Um, but look at this. They've got permanent, permanent. These are still the deciduous central incisors. So the deciduous central incisors haven't been uh, exfoliated yet. So they would be on the other end, the younger end of that range versus the older end. So like six and a half. Yeah, so I'd say six to seven, you know, I mean, or four to seven, you know, I mean, it's, but eight is, is just too old because this is the giveaway here. You've had this one before. So we've got our sixes that are articulating. 12-year molar, 12-year molar, okay? They're through the bone, but they might not be in the mouth. You are exfoliating, okay? This is a permanent premolar, of course. This is a premolar here. This tooth is almost extra, um, exfoliated for your first premolar. The second premolars have not ex, uh, erupted yet. So again, what age range? 10, 12, 15? I want to say like 12, like 11 and 12. I would say on the younger, on the younger side, I would even say nine or 10. Okay. So again, who knows unless the book tells us. Any questions? So I was going to review, I thought I was going to review, but evidently not because we're out of time. Uh, review the uh, clinical considerations. So the PowerPoint that we've already reviewed earlier is up. Just take a look at those. We've reviewed everything with each and every chapter, what the clinical considerations are. So there's no new information there. Are there any questions? Ms. D, so um, occlusion one doesn't have any divisions, right? 